Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. So I would like to welcome you to today's dinner keynote. Um, you may wonder why we do it so early. Uh, we were advised that in Australia it's better to do it right after the starter. And uh, that's why we start basically now. Now I'm extremely pleased to have Tomali Mieu uh, giving tonight's dinner speech. Uh, dinner, uh, Tomal doesn't need much introduction. Um, I met Tomal actually at a dinner about 22, 23 years ago in Paris and we were sitting in a small restaurant together with uh, David Margolis, who is the M from the AKM paper. Uh, and uh, the thing we both remember from that experience was not necessarily the quality of the food or the quality of the wine, but the table next to us was occupied by three individuals. Two of them were human, and the third one was a huge dog. And whenever I talk to Tomar about eating, we come back to that dog experience. So one reason why I prefer London to Paris is there were no dogs in London. <laughs> now, Tomar is professor of economics at the Vancouver School of Economics. He received his PhD uh, in Princeton. And since I met him in that restaurant in Paris, he has had an incredible career. Uh, not only that he wrote himself a paper which is basically containing just three letters, the DFL paper. So whenever you have a paper which is referred to by three letters, you actually have made it, AKM, DFL. Uh, but he has contributed substantially to methodology uh, in, uh, well, our field in labor economics, in applied economics, uh, decomposition uh, estimators uh, following his DFL paper and uh, many others. Uh, and he has been uh, extremely important for pushing the uh, frontier on uh, income inequality uh, and of course also on labor markets and the minimum wage. Uh, and that's exactly what he will be talking about today, minimum wage impacts going beyond employment effects to Marlem Mieux. Thank you, Christian. Uh, thanks for the kind words and reminding me about this uh, great uh, Paris uh, dog story. Um, so uh, I would also like to uh, thank the organizer and the sponsors for uh, what has been up to now a great conference. You know, we'll see in the next uh, 30 minutes. You know, if we can keep uh, keep things up. Um, and uh, before I start, I should actually say that I'm um, facing actually a couple of challenges uh, giving this talk. You know, the, the first one is that I keep reminding my thesis advisor telling me, don't ever work on the minimum wage. That's a stupid idea. That's the worst thing you could do for your career. And then the second challenge is that the same uh, thesis advisor, David Card, gave a great uh, presentation yesterday. So it's definitely raising the bar for uh, my own talk. And finally, the third thing is that uh, I think most of you have already had a couple of drinks and uh, it's, you know, and I see they are still uh, pouring things. I've also been uh, having a, a couple of drinks, but that one, you know, could be, uh, we'll see, it could cut, cut both ways, you know, maybe it's gonna help uh, the talk. All right, so um, why talk about the minimum wage? Um, Actually, as it turns out, the minimum wage is hot again. Um, and you may not realize that, you know, when you look at, at the US where the federal minimum wage actually has been stalled, if you want, at quite a low, low level now, $7.25 for a number of years. 
But actually, as it turns out, uh, there's an interesting development in the U.S. that now most workers are covered by state minimum wages that are increasingly uh, in the gap relative to the federal is actually uh, increasingly high. There's also something in, once again, North America, meaning that uh, Canada is being uh, included now. Uh, this uh, fight for 15, where for some reason the $15 minimum wage kind of became a focal point. And you may have heard that several cities in the U.S., Seattle, San Francisco, New York City, and also California is going up to a $15 minimum wage. And actually, so is half of Canada. I mean, actually, Alberta, Ontario represent uh, roughly half of the, the country. And in a year from now, we're going to have actually a much higher minimum wage than we uh, used to have. Another reason why the minimum is really hot is that now there's a minimum wage in, um, in Germany. So uh, we're talking about France. When I first met uh, Christian, France was actually the only major uh, European economy with uh, minimum wage, and now the three largest uh, country, because the UK too, which as far as I know is still part of Europe also, uh, as a minimum wage. And it's also a topical issue in Asia and uh, Australasia. According to um, Mr. Google or Wikipedia, or um, I'm pretty sure that's right, uh, New Zealand is the first country that had a national minimum wage um, at the end of the 19th century, soon followed by uh, Australia. And actually, uh, most countries in the uh, Australasia and the Asia uh, area do have minimum wages. And actually, in some cases, including China, Indonesia, India was not fully able to figure out uh, how things are working, but there seems to be lots of uh, some n national uh, variation in uh, these countries, meaning that there could be lots of interesting research to be done in the years to come. Okay, I was talking about the U.S. Let's start with, uh, with this one. Um, actually, at the time, um, Christian was talking about the DFL paper. When we worked on that, it was... Uh, looking at the impact, among other things, of the decline of the minimum wage in the U.S. in the 1980s. So you see that's the, on your left, you know, the big uh, decline in real terms, minimum wage going, you know, in, uh, in today's dollars from about $10 to uh, $7 by the end of the uh, 80s. And what's actually interesting, uh, actually the blue line is the federal minimum wage, but the red line is the real minimum wage, the average of uh, whatever is the highest minimum wage, the state or the, the federal. And you see that uh, until recently, in one sense, the f state minimum wage were buffering the, the changes in the, the federal minimum. I mean, if you see, for instance, in the about uh, <clears throat> 15 years ago, you know, when in the uh, early 2000, the federal minimum wage, the blue line was going down, so was actually the, the red line. Then there was a big increase in the federal minimum wage starting in 2007. I'll, uh, I'll ca call that the Lazier increase because uh, some of you may know that uh, Izzy was actually running the Council of Economic Advisor at the, uh, the White House when the last big increase in minimum wage happened. Uh, but now if you look at the last few years, there's actually something quite remarkable. I mean, now the red line is going up while the blue is going down. So it's actually the first time that there's a real divergence while the federal minimum wage is going down with all these new minimum wage movements, the red line, so whatever is the highest one is going up and, and now actually it's the highest real minimum wage since the uh, 80s. And you see at the bottom that cover the fraction of workers who are in the state with a higher minimum wage than the federal is uh, over 50%. I showed this picture earlier on, if some of you were at the panel session, Actually, in Canada, it's also been going up, but I was telling you about the $15. Um, 2016, the average was $11. Two years from now, in half of the country, it's going to be $15. So that's uh, lots of action, lots of potential interesting research. Uh, but that said, you know, uh, keep in mind that in the U.S. in particular, the minimum wage still has uh, room to go up. Um, this is OECD country, and you see right now, if you just look at the U.S. federal minimum, minimum relative to the, uh, the median, it's actually the lowest in this selection of country. You get a little higher up, you know, in the number four going from the, where is it, 
kind of from the left to the, no, from the right to the left, I guess. Uh, so the other US non-federal, that's when you actually put all these uh, uh, other minimum wages. And uh, France, again, and actually New Zealand are the two uh, OECD countries with the uh, largest minimum wage, with UK, Germany, Canada, somewhere in between. Okay, so that's the big picture in terms of what's been happening to the minimum wage. So, uh, okay, my title, why go beyond, uh, beyond employment effects? Well, I guess one obvious reason is that there's tons of research about uh, employment effects. Well, there's lots of other interesting aspects of what the minimum wage does that have not been explored uh, that much. So that's uh, one reason. And I would also argue that part of the focus, as probably most of you know, of uh, the research on employment effects, uh, often it's not so much aimed at trying to understand what the minimum wage does really, but it's more motivated by the uh, the good old textbook example of uh, unintended effects with perfect competition, et cetera. We can debate whether it's a good thing to teach that in um, principles, but I think in terms of if you really wanna understand what the minimum wage, as, as I just argued, you know, an increasingly important uh, policy instrument does, you have to go uh, <clears throat> beyond that because there's many other ways firms can adjust besides reducing uh, Employment, and the last bullet there is that thanks to uh, increasingly better data, you know, the kind of research you can do on the minimum wage and other aspects where you have an interesting interaction between uh, workers and firms, following up on some of what David was talking about. Uh, uh, it really has opened up lots of uh, possibilities. Okay, so if I was to think of, uh, well, let's forget the textbook example and just think more broadly if I really want to figure out what the minimum wage does, how should we go about it? Uh, another thing I learned in graduate school uh, from Orlash and Felter is that the first thing you want to check is that whether there's actually a minimum wage uh, policy because employers may not comply with the minimum wage and more importantly, if the minimum wage is so low that it doesn't affect anybody uh, and then you run a regression and find that uh, it has no effect on employment, it's not gonna be very interesting, and if you find that it has negative effect on employment despite the fact it doesn't affect uh, anybody, that would be a little weird, but don't laugh, some papers um, proceeded that way uh, a number of years ago. Um, so once you've established that minimum wage really does something, in one sense, the first order impact, if you want, is the uh, impact on the wage distribution, how much it's lifting up uh, wages, and also, uh, how the impact on distribution can be even larger if you have uh, spillover effects. So essentially having a higher minimum wage also pushes up wages a bit above the minimum. And I'm actually gonna talk a little more about that at the end because that's been uh, something I've been working on uh, recently. But you know, when you think about how firms can adjust in minimum wage, you know, of course you have reduced employment, you make one input more expensive. Uh, there can be some uh, factor substitution. But there's also many other things that can happen, especially uh, once you start allowing for some uh, imperfect competition in either the product or the, the, the labor market. So firms can take a hit in terms of profits, you know, uh, so essentially absorb some of the wage increases that way. You can have some price pass through, you know, if the, depending on the structure of the, the, the product market, so you can essentially pass the cost to a consumer and there can be some other, uh, you know, uh, in addition to a substitution to capital, uh, some uh, technological change could help uh, deal with that. Okay, so now uh, for the, rem so that's essentially just setting the stage here about the different dimensions of uh, impacts of minimum wage you could look at. So now uh, let me uh, tell you what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk. So of course it's unavoidable to say something about employment effects, but I'm only gonna have one slide about this, so uh, that's um, not gonna play too much of a role, but I'm gonna take advantage of that to tell you about the different uh, research designs that have been used to look at the minimum wage and how it could, can be applied uh, in different countries. Uh, and then second bullet, what I just talked about, other modes of adjustment, what have we learned about that uh, recently? And then at the end, uh, something about uh, spillover effects. 
Okay, so even though my thesis advisor told me it was a terrible idea um, to work on the minimum wage, maybe it was based on his own experience, I'm not quite sure, but you know, David, of course, has made uh, uh, absolutely fundamental contributions to this uh, topic. And actually, the, the famous card and courier diff and diff paper at Pennsylvania, New Jersey, was actually using the two key uh, research designs. It's uh, one of a few examples uh, using that. Well, one is the, what I call the more traditional difference in difference. So you compare different areas being uh, uh, affected by different minimum wage, something you can do in the US or in Canada, but not in many other uh, countries. And, and one advantage of that approach is that you can actually, uh, as long as you know these markets are fairly separated, if you want, not too closely connected, you can actually get some broad impact of the minimum wage. So for instance, maybe some firms paying a little above the minimum wage uh, will be competing with uh, some minimum wage firms and may, may also adjust in some ways, meaning that you have a little bit of some um, general equilibrium effect. So that's actually a, a benefit of that approach. But you know, the weakness that many people have pointed out in some cases, the change may be endogenous, which is why Often the good study try to find something, an uh, unexpected change in minimum wage. And sometimes it gets a little tricky to find a good control group, uh, especially if you have only one state or city changing the, its minimum. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing that actually Card and Kruger was, uh, were doing, actually the U.S. is not a great country to do that. If you want to look within firms, you know, how many workers are potentially affected but in minimum wage, the reason is that admin data in the US doesn't have good uh, early wage uh, information. But in the survey that David and Alan had done, they had this information, meaning that even within, say, New Jersey, you can look at which firms have more uh, minimum wage workers, what I call here the fraction affected, or something that you can call the wage gap essentially just to comply with the minimum wage by how much firms would have to uh, increase their, their wage. Okay. And the big advantage of that approach is that you can use that in countries where you only have a nationwide minimum wage, which is actually most countries, so that's uh, very useful. But as I just mentioned, you know, if you think you have some G effects or what the program evaluation people call failure of SUDVA could be a bit of a problem. Okay, so employment effects. Um, well, I was personally uh, quite convinced by the evidence in the Card and Kruger book, but I may be a little, uh, uh, well, it's my advisor. Uh, but the way I like to tell students when I teach that topic, it's like, okay, well, there was all this controversy in the US, blah, 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 but let's, so current career, 1995, so let's forget about all this US stuff and now look at what happened in some other countries where you had some big changes and then let's do a real test, you know, a totally science fic, you know, we didn't know in 95 what would these minimum wage be, uh, et cetera. Uh, so here I have actually uh, four examples. So the first one, probably the best known one, was uh, that in 1999, UK introduced um, national minimum wage. Steve could actually, uh, Steve Machen could give this uh, part of the talk. And actually there were some good studies based on this fraction affected uh, design, if you want, looking at some firms where you have lots of minimum wage workers versus others where you don't. And essentially the finding was that there were little, very few uh, employment effects. Uh, another interesting study, another interesting change uh, around the same time in Hungary, this paper by Harris Tosi and uh, Lindner, um, there was actually a doubling of the minimum wage there in two years. So essentially the minimum wage went from the US federal to the French minimum wage, if you remember my, uh, the, the picture I had early on. And they also have excellent firm data, meaning that uh, they have lots of power because the change is really big and lots of data because they have information on, uh, on all firms. And actually in that case, but remember, you know, it's uh, doubling the minimum wage as if we're going from 7.25 to $15 at the national level in, in the US. And they actually do find, unlike most of this other literature, very precisely estimated effects. So small negative impact, but uh, clearly very far away from the minus one elasticity. And something interesting also, uh, getting sense about the role of product market there is that they have so much data and power, they can look at different industry. And for instance, if you look at exporting 
firms that in some cases are affected by the minimum wage, there actually the impact on employment is uh, larger. Okay, this part of the world, uh, Dean Hislop and Steve Stillman have a nice study for New Zealand where there was a, actually a big change in the youth uh, minimum wage. Didn't find any uh, impact there either. And of course, the question on everyone's mind, what's happening to Germany? Uh, there's rumors about what are the, uh, the impacts. And uh, yeah, I think that if we keep pouring wine in uh, Christian's glass you know, for the rest of the, uh, the evening, we may actually uh, get to know the answer to that, uh, that question. <clears throat> All right, okay, I should bring Steve Machen again. Uh, on the profits and uh, firm value side, uh, Steve had this really nice study in the UK uh, where they have better firm data than um, in the US. They were able to do this gap kind of uh, design and found that firms were actually absorbing an important part of the extra cost of the minimum wage to uh, lower profits. This Hungarian paper, uh, same kind of thing. The Card and Courier book actually uh, was taking a different look at that by looking at the uh, stock market reaction uh, of firms that are affected. So think of big firms employing lots of uh, minimum wage workers. Um, and actually found some weak impact of, uh, weak evidence of uh, a negative impact on the stock market value. And actually uh, Steve has a great paper with uh, Brian Bell that looks at a completely unexpected uh, increase the minimum wage in the UK. It was actually uh, a new living, national living wage uh, announced in the budget, I think it was 2015 or something, see if you could correct me, by George Osborne. Completely unexpected and actually at the time it was announced 1.35 p.m. Uh, they have this great Evans study showing that in minutes that follow some of these firms uh, with lots of minimum wage workers, you saw the stock market value uh, go down quite quickly. So that's actually another very nice piece of evidence, and here we're dealing with this endogeneity of the uh, minimum wage because you get something completely uh, unexpected. Another way, uh, recent research, you see there's lots of 2016, 17, um, et cetera. In price pass-through, again, Cardin Kruger had some evidence that in the case of restaurants, uh, minimum wage goes up, uh, prices Go up, Dan Aronson, there's actually lots of nice paper on that. There's a few other uh, recent one. So it looks that in that particular sector, there's actually quite a bit of uh, price pass-through. A um, few other studies in the US have tried to look at other factor, sectors where you don't have quite as many uh, minimum wage workers and power is really an issue because uh, labor costs actually, as it turns out, tend to be often close to 15% and in their case, they were looking at grocery stores. So if labor costs are not that high, uh, labor, the labor share is not that high because lots of materials in these um, kind of firms and you don't have such a big minimum wage it's increase, it's actually hard to detect uh, impact. So once again, this Hungarian paper where you had the doubling of the minimum wage with lots of good uh, firm data, they did find actually substantial pass-through in sectors besides uh, uh, restaurants. And there's actually a recent Seattle study that uh, find the same kind of things. Okay, so, um, so that was actually the summary of the uh, recent research showing that, I uh, should keep this other slide here, uh, showing that actually there's lots of different ways firms uh, adjust to change in the minimum wage. Uh, employment, in some study, there's a little bit of a change in employment, but what you really see is that it's, uh, it's actually a much more uh, complex and Interesting story in, uh, in many ways. So now let me uh, go back to kind of the first order effect of the, the minimum wage. So uh, you raise the minimum wage, what happens to the wage distribution, and in particular, uh, what happens to uh, spillover effects. So forget about the turnover in this title. I just wanted to show you that this was based on uh, joint work I'm doing with my uh, colleague David Green and Pierre Brochu and James Thompson. Um, so now you can see that I'm just uh, being lazy using some, uh, some other slides, but um, there's actually lots of work, not as much as on employment, but you know, in the US in part here in the UK, uh, people have looked at these issues, uh, including at spillover effect. But actually recently there's been a bit of a controversy in the US. Uh, David Lee actually had a very influential study where he showed, remember this big decline in the minimum wage, uh, 
in the US in 1980s, um, he noticed the fact that when you were looking at low wage states where the minimum wage was much more binding, it could actually detect some impact of this big decline in the minimum wage on, on wages above the, the minimum. He actually concluded that two, about two thirds of the growth in inequality at the bottom end of the distribution that was really big in those years was uh, linked to that. But you know, it was not the greatest research design because all the variation was at the national level. So then in one sense, uh, um, yet to use the fact that, okay, let's say the median wage is different across different states. So we're gonna use a blend of variation in the median wage versus the minimum wage to uh, get this. Now you can actually do a much better job thanks to the, case, the fact that uh, you have lots of variation in state minimum uh, wages. So we can really start tracking down how movements in the state minimum wage affect the, the wage distribution, including above. And actually, in a provocative paper, you know, I would say uh, Otter, Manning, and Smith revisit the, the, uh, the work and actually find much smaller um, spillover effects. Um, and I was actually a little bit surprised by their finding of pretty low uh, spillover effects because of work I did myself in, uh, in Canada with Nicole Fortin again. So um, I hope everyone can see this, uh, this picture. If you know the ins and outs of literature, these are actually Div David Lee's uh, type of picture, but let me tell you quickly what it is. In the first uh, upper left corner, I start with the fifth percentile, then go to the 10th, the 15th, and the, the 20th. And that's basically a plot of what, what the value of this fifth percentile as a function of the minimum wage. It's actually normalized by the median, but uh, anyway, if if you're on the 45 degree line, it means that in that case, the fifth percentile is actually equal to the minimum wage. And you see actually in most cases in Canada, that's roughly, that's men and women together. So that's actually roughly where the minimum wage is, okay? And obviously, if the fifth percentile is at the minimum wage and you raise the minimum wage, well, the fifth percentile is gonna go up and, uh, and you see that's exactly what's happening. But it's almost mechanical in that case. Now when you look at the 10th percentile, you see all these points are above the 45 degree line, meaning that the 10th percentile is above the minimum. But you see that when the minimum wage is moving up, I mean, clearly the 10th percentile is moving up too. Now we're looking at variation across provinces and years. And then you go up to the 15th percentile and again, you know, at, at the bottom left, what happened, these are actually uh, provinces where the minimum wage is really low and to the point that it doesn't affect things very much. But you see, when you get more of your modal uh, value of the minimum wage, uh, clearly when the minimum wage you know, on the x-axis is going up, you see that the, even the 15th percentile is going up. Well, the 20th percentile, it gets a little more challenging. You know, If you're creative, you'll find a positive slope here. But if you're a little more honest, you'll see a flat line uh, here. But still, we are starting from a minimum wage being roughly at the fifth percentile, and the 15th percentile is quite a bit um, higher up. Okay, so um, this work with my uh, co-authors, uh, we use that as a point of, uh, point of departure. Uh, as I said, you know, trying now to uh, fully exploit this variation both in the US and Canada that you have at the sub-regional uh, level. Um, and the last bullets at the bottom um, is just telling you a little bit uh, how we approach this problem. And, and I realize that for, uh, you're all waiting for, uh, for dinner, so you know, I'm gonna go pretty quickly over the, the, the details. But you know, one of the first thing is that instead of modeling these wage quantiles that you were seeing in the previous pictures, uh, what we do is to let model directly the probability that the wages are going to be in different uh, wage bins. And uh, what's nice about this, then you can look precisely, you know, if you're exactly at the minimum wage, how does that change the probability that we observe lots of provision in that bin? If you're a little bit above, you know, what's the, uh, and the minimum wage goes up, do we see that the probability of being uh, around there? So let's say you, minimum wage goes from nine to $10, do we see that the probability, the concentration in people at $11 is going up? And if so, that's evidence of spillover effects. 
Or actually, if you thought there were big uh, employment effects, you could think that, oh no, all that's happening is that you're truncating the bottom of the distribution, so you get the illusion that the, uh, you get more people higher up, and it's not really because you have these spillover effects, but just because you've truncated at the, the bottom. So that's something we want to uh, deal with too. And something else in modeling that is to, uh, you know, model the effect of the minimum wage as a proportional fraction of essentially how binding it is, if you want. So if you have lots of people in the part of the distribution where the minimum wage is, uh, is uh, you should actually uh, have a much bigger impact of the minimum wage on the distribution than if the minimum wage is really low and doesn't bite. So we want a model that will also uh, get that. And uh, that may find sound a little surprising to you. Sorry, I have two equations, but that's going to be uh, very quick. But actually, uh, David Green had a paper a long time ago that I first thought was a little bit crazy trying to uh, model the wage distribution using a uh, hazard model. But actually, um, that approach, and I'll just say it in words, has actually a n couple of interesting features that um, are actually quite useful for looking at minimum wage impact. First one, actually, all the hazard is is that you're conditioning on where you are in the wage distribution. So uh, instead of looking at the probability that I'm going to be between $12 and $12 and 10 cents, you know, over the old distribution, I'm going to say, oh, conditional on making it to $12, what's the fraction of wage observation above $12 that are between $12 and $12.10? And actually, the beauty of that is that even if w the minimum wage below that going up and down causes some people to leave the labor market or attract more workers in the labor market, it's not going to change this conditional uh, uh, probability higher up. So, so in one sense, that's a way of controlling for this election that may come from the fact that you may have some employment effect. Um, then this equation two there, remember the proportionality, you know, there's a good reason why people call that proportional uh, hazard model. So it's set up in a multiplicative way, so which is another feature that uh, we like. And uh, the points at the bottom, you know, it also helps you deal with uh, some kind of issue. So for instance, when you look at wage data, it's true both in Canada and the US, about 30% of the people are at an integer value of wages like $10, $11, exactly. Some of it is real, but you know, lots of it could be measurement error. So you can actually uh, correct for that in that um, setting. It actually does make uh, quite a bit of difference. And then the last thing I want to say, and I'm just going to uh, illustrate that with a, a picture. What's also nice about that is you can estimate these kind of models with a essentially using it, what we call a triple difference design, or uh, we're actually gonna use the fact that if you want the minimum wage dose is actually different depending on whether you're exactly at the minimum wage a little bit above or quite a bit above. In other words, uh, we're gonna use as controls uh, wage bins. So you see here, I've cut the, the, the data in, uh, in wage bins. You know, uh, wage bids that we think are high enough so that they are probably not affected by spillover effects. And obviously, it's a specification issue you can deal with. So uh, here, I'm kind of using a baseline where you have a uniform probability, uh, uniform hazard. And uh, what you see is that, OK, now if the minimum wage goes from 8 to $9, and just the illustration here, we have spillover effects going up to $2 about the minimum wage. So then what you'll see is that when you start going in these bins here and you look at the impact of a change in minimum wage, so suddenly the probability is actually going up. When you get closer, it's actually going up a little more. So actually starting from this side, you can sort of recover, you know, all the impacts, all the spillover effects of the minimum wage and also the, the big spike, okay? So that's the idea. And actually at, at this point, I'm pretty much done. Uh, I'm really doing my, my best to... Uh, Speed up, and I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, graph, um, okay, data from Canada, great. Uh, lots of variation in the minimum wage in Canada, great. Um, big sample, about 50,000 households per month. That's a big survey, labor force survey in Canada, about 100,000 workers uh, per month. And then, of course, we started doing that with, uh, with Canada, and when we started getting some interesting results, we realized that Okay, if we want to uh, people to pay attention and, and publish that work in a, in a better place, gotta run it for the US. So uh, 
Uh, I'll show you a few results about the US too. So this is actually uh, the results uh, kind of for women. And actually in that case, we just let the spillovers go up uh, quite high. But what you actually see is that once you pass two or two dollars and a half about the minimum wage, you know, it gets uh, pretty small. I mean, here's it's actually a, an impact on the log probability, what I'm showing you. If you look at men, where you have a little less precision, you, then you really see clearly that uh, after about $2, you have uh, less of an impact. And now to uh, quantify that, um, that's going to be one of my last kind of a key picture. Now I've actually translated these impacts on log probabilities in, uh, on impact on the level. So uh, now if you look at this big spike at the minimum wage, so what you see is that when in a 10 cents wage bin you have the minimum wage, it increases by seven or 800 percent the probability of observing wages there. And then you see also what happens a little uh, higher up in the, the distribution. And to give you a sense of what it means in, uh, in practice in terms of uh, impacts, uh, what I've put here is actually the cumulative distribution. Uh, it's actually an average cumulative over all the uh, province and, and years, actually normalized over the minimum wage. but. All that matters is the following is that, let's say this is a cumulative distribution that you're observing, the big red line. And now if you say, okay, let's remove these minimum wage effects that I'm getting, and then I construct a counterfactual distribution, which is uh, the dollar lines there. And then you actually see visually, the first thing is that for women in Canada, uh, cumulative distribution here, 20, it means that uh, the impact of the minimum wage goes up to about the 20th percentile on average, which is similar actually to uh, some of the figures I was showing earlier. And that's despite the fact that if you look right at the minimum here, uh, for women on average, the minimum wage is about at the sixth or seventh percentile. So you see that it actually uh, goes up uh, quite a bit. Now, not surprisingly for men, uh, because men, the distribution is shifted to the, shifted to the right, which means that the cumulative distribution, the red line, is lower down there. So not surprisingly, actually, the effect doesn't go up quite as much in the distribution, more the 10th or the, the, the 15th. But actually, one point I should have mentioned is that if you compare these blue lines, you know, the effect for men and women, you see they are actually quite similar. So that's this thing I was telling you with the proportionality. So essentially, it suggests that we've dealt well with this uh, proportionality. So is we get the, the same relative impact of the minimum wage, and it's just that once you uh, run that to a different distribution, you're going to find something different. And now, of course, the results for the US um, actually run the same thing using the state variation starting in 87, when you have lots of uh, variation in the minimum wage. And if I show you the same kind of pictures as for Canada, you see that's women. Uh, the impact is not quite as big, but it still runs up to the 15th or the 20th uh, percentile. Well, for men, not surprisingly, uh, because the minimum wage is lower down the distribution, I mean, you see here, we're below the fifth uh, percentile. But despite that, uh, the minimum wage still seems to have an impact up to the 10th and maybe a little bit uh, above. All right, uh, apologies if I went a little fast, but uh, I know you're uh, all hungry and waiting for the, the next, uh, next part of the meal to come. So, uh, well, conclusion, I've said uh, everything already that uh, after looking at that again, you know, it seems that uh, the minimum wage not only affects people at the minimum, but there's a big uh, spillover uh, above the minimum, obviously important for inequality. And what I said uh, before, it's not uh, my research, but you know, I think the new research on the minimum wage has shown that it's not like there's no evidence at all of a negative, uh, small negative impact on, on wages. But you know, I think it's really interesting to now learn about all the ways uh, firms are actually adjusting to the minimum wage. And that's particularly important since, uh, as I told you earlier, minimum wage are going up, more countries are being uh, covered. Many other social programs are perhaps disappearing. So the minimum wage may actually be uh, increasing, playing an increasingly big role in many uh, economies in the year to come. So uh, having learned more about uh, the impact it has, I think is uh, quite useful. And on that note, uh, I'm going to stop.
Okay, tomorrow. Thank you very much for this uh, very insightful talk, and I'm sure over the next years uh, and the next ASLE conferences, we will hear much more about minimum wages, not just in Europe and in the US, but also in Asian countries. And in Germany. And of course in Germany. <laughs> now, um, we actually thought to have some questions. However, uh, the kitchen is waiting to serve the main, and I was just thinking, if uh, Bob asked the first question, then we may just go straight to the dessert. <laughs> so I suggest we drop the questions, and uh, I wish you a great evening and a great dinner. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah.